Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com, and welcome to the first Watch and Learn of 2018. I know it's been a while. Uh, things have been hectic, crazy, whatever, but it's time to get back to basics and do some Watch and Learns. I'll do a wrist check first on one, if it stays up, because it's a monster, is a Zin 757UTC Chrono, and then I'm still wearing the Yacht Master. Uh, if you have a sharp eye, you'll note that actually today is the 30th. So I'm filming this before the end of the year because uh, I, I had some time and I thought I would use it wisely. So today's watch and learn is going to be about shock protection in watches. The gen gen generally, the two terms that you hear or that are most famous are KIF and Inca block. Both do very similar things. It's just kind of the implementation of the spring that makes them different, two-point versus three-point. And then later on in the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down a Seiko movement of 7S26, and we'll go through their shock protection, which I'm pretty sure they call Diashock. Everyone's got kind of like their own name. I believe Rolex has Parashock, Diashock, Kif, Inca Block. No matter what you think, no matter what you call it, they're all doing the same thing. They are doing shock protection. And why do you need shock protection? What is shock protection? Well, when watches first came out, you know, gen uh, generally, you know, balance type movements, watchmakers biggest, the biggest thing they fix all the time was broken balances, the, the pivots or the staff. So, you know, the balance of the wheel with the two things on either side, very thin and delicate. Those things would break if you drop the watch or if it, you know, basically when you drop a watch, it gets a, a large shock. And that little piece that's going like this really fast that you see in a skeleton watch uh, has a lot of mass uh, for its size because it's got that, you know, it's got a lot of inertia, right? It's got a, it's a big hoop with spokes, and then at the end, these really, really, really tiny, you know, shafts that go into jewels or into a plate or whatever, and when you drop the watch, the balance wants to keep moving, the watch stops, the balance keeps going, and you probably wind up with a broken, a broken uh, staff on the balance or a pivot or whatever they call it. I don't even know what they call it, honestly. I've always called them pivots because uh, it's like a pivot point. But anyway, so shock protection came along, and what shock protection does is it uses a spring and a bunch of jewels to basically allow the balance wheel to float in space when it encounters a shock. So let's say, again, in the same situation, you drop the watch, the watch stops, the balance keeps moving uh, just a little bit because it's got a spring on uh, these on the capsules. It's got a spring and it slows it down very gradually. And if it overstresses or if it goes too far, uh, the thicker part of the balance, the center, uh, where the shafts are coming out of, is what impacts the watch. And those don't break because they're they're very robust and thick. So the gentle part, that very thin part that the whole thing is balancing on back and forth, that is uh, cushioned or protected. So you'll see in a moment, you know, how it works is the the entire system, the balance and the jewels. So you got the balance in the middle, it spins back and forth like this. You could see tons of, there's actually YouTube uh, demonstrations on this that people have done, you know, 3D graphic. Uh, but anyway, so the whole balance system and the jewels, uh, regular jewel and like a cap jewel, are suspended in springs. And that's, that's basically what the whole thing is. It's like, a, it's like a big shock absorber. Except instead of seeing a coil spring like you'd see in a car, it's a leaf spring. You know, maybe like you've seen a truck suspension. Uh, it's a leaf spring that, that's hooked under something. And it allows the whole system to move just a little bit. And basically what you're doing at that point is you are, instead of getting the impulse where the thing stops and all the force happens, is you are increasing the time of connection and therefore reducing the maximum amount of force that the object feels. Again, it's just a conservation of momentum, impulse kind of thing. Uh, we're slowing it down uh, so that it doesn't break. So anyway, it's really cool. It's really simple. It obviously works a whole bunch because every single watch has it. And I'm not just talking, you know, you know, your Ed is, your, your Rolex is, your Pat. The cheapest, cheapest... Chinese mass-produced seagull movement that's in 
knockoff watches has shock protection. They all have it because they all need it because really your watch is just six inches away from a failure if you were to drop it. Before we get to the video, I just, you know, I shot the whole thing. This time it was under the microscope. I use a different setup instead of filming my monitor. I kind of tried to capture it on a capture card. And it worked out well, except I, the audio isn't really what I had hoped for. So just bear with that part. But other than that, uh, I thought it was a great video. So uh, let's get over and check out what shock protection is. So before we get under the microscope, I wanted to just take a minute and just show the watch movement again, just so we don't lo lose track of everything in the microscopic sense. So we'll take a step back. Here's the watch movement. This is normally the dial side. Obviously, the dial is missing. You can see the date ring. Uh, this is off of a, uh, this is a Seiko 7S26 movement that's been kicking around. Uh, the auto winder, and underneath the auto winder, you can see right there is the balance wheel and associated shock protection. We're going to zoom in on it. Now, we will get much closer under the microscope, but we can see the balance wheel here. I'm going to stop it. It's, it's uh, vibrating or, you know, oscillating back and forth. And then up over here, we can see the, uh, the cap jewel. Uh, these are the jewels that hold the balance wheel in, uh, and that is the shock protection. This spring right here basically forms the shock absorber. And again, we will see this under the microscope shortly. What I'm going to do next is I have one of these balance wheels without the mainspring attached, or excuse me, without the hairspring attached. I have one of them here. I'm going to pick it up and show it to you just so you can get a sense for how fragile this little piece of, uh, this little piece of the watch movement is. So this is the balance wheel. You can see it's a hoop with two spokes on it. You, you know, on an Edda there's three or four spokes, or three spokes, I think. Everybody's different, but obviously this is a fairly inexpensive movement, fairly inexpensive balance wheel. But it's a hoop with two spokes, and if I turn it like this, you can kind of see points top and bottom, and that is what interacts with the watch, uh, with the watch shock protection. Those are the little two pivots that the balance wheel oscillates about, and they are extremely, extremely fragile. Those are the pieces that I mentioned before that break extremely easily uh, in a shock. So that is what we're protecting, those little teeny tiny pins sticking out of either end. That is what shock protection aims to, uh, well, to shock protect. It's really a fascinating piece of the movement, and obviously, truly, you know, one of the parts of the heart, uh, you know, making up you know, everything that keeps ticking along and, and keeping everything accurate. So now let's, uh, let's get under the microscope and see how this works. So for our discussion on shock protection, today we're going to be looking at a Seiko 7S26 movement that was taken out of, I believe, a, a Seiko 5 watch. And we're going to be looking, I guess, about shock protection. And shock protection generally is found on the balance, which is right here. This here's the balance wheel. I don't believe this movement works. Uh, the balance wheel is here. It oscillates or pivots about the center. And because it has, you know, a decent amount of mass or weight for its size, it is protected against bumps and shocks so that it doesn't break. It's moving around a lot, it's twisting back and forth, as you've heard me discuss in other videos, six, eight times a second. So it really is susceptible to breakage quite easily. So they shock protect it. What we're going to do is we're going to switch it up a little bit and zoom in now on this area where the tip of my tweezers are, because that is where the shock protection is happening. So here now we've zoomed in a little bit. I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit more, but I want to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Again, here is the capsule for the, I believe Seiko calls it dia shock, uh, shock protection. There's a spring that goes over it. That is this spring that I am tracing my tweezers with. It's not a spring in the, uh, in the effect of, uh, or in the idea of a, a coil spring. It's more or less like a leaf spring. It's tucked under here with some tabs. And just for reference, here's the regulator lever. You can see the notch is pointing somewhere along the midline. Whoops. So as you can see, everything is very small here. Uh, so we'll zoom in just a little bit more, and then we'll, we'll get to work on taking this apart. And just for reference, these are number five tweezers. I mean, they are a little bit beat up, uh, but they are the finest tweezers I have, finest meaning, uh, excuse me, 5A. Uh, they are the finest, meaning the sharpest point. And even then, under this magnification, you can see they appear quite blunt. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they work for the task. 
Okay, so now we're zoomed in even more. I don't want to go any closer than this because, well, I can't even get my tweezer on the work that I'm doing. But I'm going to just nudge this spring. You can see it's actually a little bit loose. I, I did um, some work on the other side, other side of the movement to, um, to make it a little bit easier for me to twist around. So I'm just going to grab the spring and see I'm actually twisting the movement instead of the spring directly. Oops, and did you see it just literally just fly out? Um, I actually have another one here, so you can see what it looks like. I'm really not worried about capturing these parts. Again, this is all stuff from the infamous junk bin, if you will. Actually, there you go. I actually found the spring on the little work mat that I'm on. Uh, just for reference, these squares that you see are five millimeters, so what is that, about a fifth of an inch from year to year. Um, so you can see this piece is definitely quite small, um, so maybe it's two and a half millimeters or so tip to tip, which is, you know, what, a tenth of an inch, and obviously extremely, extremely super thin. So now let's go back to the movement and see what the cap jewel looks like under the spring. So now you can see the spring is gone. It was laying across here. And now as I touch this, you see that this jewel is actually moving with the balance uh, because the end of the balance staff, the pivot, is actually poking into the jewel. And I'm going to try to lift it out. You can actually, you know, before we do that, let's zoom in on this jewel so we can actually look in the center of it and see what we see. I have a feeling once it's out, it's going to be tough to see anything. So I'm zoomed way in on this jewel. I can't get my tweezers in it, but if you look in the center, you could see a small dot. And that is the balance post poking through, and that's what uh, balance, you know, like I showed you before, that's what balances on the shock protection part, and that's what moves left, right, up, down to protect it from shock. And instead of the balance absorbing all the shock, the jewel is what absorbs the shock with the spring. Actually, the spring, excuse me, the spring absorbs the shock. The jewel simply transfers it to the spring. And again, jewels are used because they're very low friction devices. So let's try to zoom back a bit now, and we'll try to pick up this jewel here. Okay, so here we are. Look at that. One fell swoop. It actually came right out with the, uh, it's in a bushing and everything. So I'm going to try to just remove this gently. We'll come back to that in a second. And now we can really see in to the center of what we were looking at before. I guess we could see it. And as I grab it and wiggle it, do you see the balance wheel moving? I'm actually grabbing the balance. So I'm going to zoom in again so you can see how fragile this post is or how, you know, the diameter of it. I have no idea what the diameter is. Uh, it's extremely small. I don't have anything that comes remotely close to measuring it. So there we are. We're now in the center, and the field of view is so small that as I vary the focus, you can see. So, again, I cannot get tweezers in there or anything. But So you see the black ring in the center. It's a little bit, it's not centered perfectly because I have the, camera off at an angle so you can kind of get some depth perception. Uh, that is just blank space. And then as I change the level of zoom, you can kind of see the balance step. And then at the end, let me try to bring it back. That is the end of the balance. The thing uh, maybe on the, just on the right side of center of your screen, that is the pivot that sits with the jewel and uh, moves back again back and forth, up and down the the whole nine yards. So again, now that you saw that, I'll just kind of move around a bit. So again, this is the balance. And you can see as I move it back and forth, look at the, the center of the balance. You can see it wiggling back and forth. So it floats. The whole thing is set to float. And the float is held in place by a spring transmitted by a jewel for friction. And that is what gives it shock protection. Um, it's yeah, ingenious. I don't know if it's exactly ingenious. It's a great idea. Uh, you know, movable links have been in existence for quite some time in, in engineering, you know, because you can't transfer the force. So you have to, you can't transfer the force, you know, immediately. You need to spread out over time so they use a spring. Next, I want to just bring up. Oh, by the way, this is kind of echoed on the other side of the movement, the same exact thing. Uh, it's on both sides because the whole thing moves up, down, you know, in, in and out of the plane of your computer and uh, left, right. 
Uh, I want to just now see if we can take a look at that cap jewel that I took out and put on the side. So this is the bottom side of the jewel. It's still set. The whole thing is set in a bushing of sorts. Uh, I want to zoom in on this now uh, even closer. And you can, you'll be, should be able to see the center where the balance pivot uh, poked through. And I don't know if you can see it. Um, I'm on it as best as I can. Uh, you can definitely see some kind of a detail in the center of that jewel. Let me get it more in the center there. Uh, you can definitely see a detail in the center, and that is where uh, the balance pivot lies. Now let's flip it over and look at the other side. From this side, you can definitely see the center. Um, it actually might even be etched with a, a crosshair. I don't know. I think I see something in there <laughs> that, de that denotes the exact center. And then uh, this, is a, this is as zoomed in as I can get on this thing. Uh, but you definitely see some kind of a hole in the center. And you know, in here, I guess, are two jewels. There's a jewel at the bottom that the uh, pivot is passing through, and then the cap jewel at the top that the whole thing is resting in, and then it's all in this bushing, which I am not going to even attempt to open up. Not that I could put it back together, but just from the fact that I don't have anything small enough to even do that work. And just before we close it out, I want to just show you guys for a sense of scale of what we're looking at. I, here's a dime, it's an American dime, uh, that I put on the mat. And here's the jewel or the cap jewel that was on one end of the balance and the spring that was over it. So it is very fine work, very precise work. And I'll, I'll say it as many times as I, as I need to. But watchmaker's work is extremely fine and delicate. I am not a watchmaker. I could never put this stuff back together. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe I could. I might do a lot of cursing. Uh, but, you know, it's just amazing, simply amazing, the scale of the things that we are looking at and the accuracy that we're asking from these things and, you know, just to stop and sit back for a second. I'm like, oh, my goodness, there's, you know, what, 21 of these in a watch movie, you know, 21 jewels just for friction points or 25 or 35 or 17, whatever it may be, my, you know, and then all the gears and everything else. Just again, just simply amazing. Anyway, this has been Mark from LongIslandWatch.com. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so yet. If you have any questions or comments, please put them down below, and I'll be sure to address them as soon as I can. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.